glad to see you all here. Um, I'm going to be alone tonight. Uh, Professor Wentz is Munoz is um, working on his dissertation, the final touches he'd be, he's presenting tomorrow. So it's a big day for him tomorrow. So he asked me if it'd be okay if he um, worked on that. I said, of course. So um, before we get started, um, let's see. I'm, I'm, there might be a lot of questions, um, and I'm, since I'm here by myself, I'm going to try to answer those best I can. Uh, if you'd like to speak, you can raise your hand, and then I can allow you to speak. Um, but as it as it is right now, um, it, it might be easier just to to um, put something in the chat box or in the question and answer because I can see those pop up. Um, everybody can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Somebody said I, I have sound. Um, so uh, tonight's topic is going to be on um, addictions and trauma, and I found out how to turn on the uh, closed captioning. They move the setting, so it's uh, a little easier now. So hopefully, anybody who who relies on that or it's it's helpful. It's always helpful for me, um, especially when I'm taking notes. Um, and don't forget, we're going to record. The, this is being recorded now, and it will be um, uploaded to YouTube as well. So. Let me just check to see if that's actually true. Yeah, it's recording. Okay. So I decided um, on this topic tonight, and I'm going to come a little overzealous, so I probably have way more slides than we're going to need. Um, so we might jump around a little bit and see where the, um, where the topic takes us based upon some feedback from you folks. Um, but it's... Um, it's one that's uh, really important to understand. Um, I think a, a lot of uh, clinicians are not well trained in um, trauma informed care and misunderstand a lot of the symptoms and a lot of the uh, areas concerning it. I'm gonna kind of go into some more novel um, explanations of how um, addictions and trauma coexist and manifest and, uh, and some some etymology surrounding that that might be a little bit controversial um and of course i'm just speaking anecdotally so um in my you know 13 years of practice it isn't necessarily what's in the research and i'll be sure to, to delineate what's in the research and then what's my clinical experience because i think that's kind of where you get the real picture in those two things um so let's get started here um Okay, so first off, we're gonna talk about some of the prevalence of, um, of the diagnostic uh, criteria of addictions related to trauma, or trauma related to addictions, considerations for treatment of co-occurring disorders. And we say co-occurring disorders, and I'll try to remember to explain a lot of the clinical vernacular while you are um, studying some of that stuff in, in the human services programs, if you're uh, a major, there might be other folks here who are different majors and that, that isn't necessarily um, their focus. So, um, and then some recommended treatment approaches. Um, as I was putting this uh, lecture together, I thought, well, you know, there's some things that they might need to know about specifically why it's so important. I, I'm sure we can imagine from our own personal perspectives and the things we see in the media. Um, but there's some really dire uh, situations, especially here in Nevada, um, and I wanted to highlight that. But, um, so, so looking at prevalence of SUD, and SUD means substance use disorder. This is a clinical term that we use. It's from the DSM-5, our uh, mental illness uh, uh, Bible, you could say. Um, and so uh, 9.5 million or 3.8% of adults over the age of 18, both have a substance abuse disorder and a mental illness. So these are co-occurring, these are happening at the same time. SUDs affect over 20 million Americans, age 12 and over, uh, the most common disorder related to marijuana and prescription pain relievers. So, and then I thought it'd be uh, a good order to, to see how that plays out in um, Nevada. Using that same factor, um, in Nevada, it's a little bit less, 3.01% uh, of the population 12 years and older were identified to have an illicit drug use disorder in the past year. Um, 12 to 17, it's 4.51%. 18 
18 to 25, these pay attention, these are, these are mostly your college years, 6.86%. So you can see there's a quite a bit of a jump there. And then as people get a little bit older, you see it kind of wind down. And that's 2.26% uh, of folks 26 years and older. So that's some good news. And you, as, as folks mature and are able to better handle or have had some experiences, um, they hopefully start making some different decisions that are healthier for their mind, body, and their life. Okay, so I got this um, from SAMHSA's website, and SAMHSA is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health uh, Administration, the feds. You know, we get a lot of grant money to run programs, to provide treatment, to provide training. They're a really a tremendous resource. And if you're in uh, one of our human services programs, I'm sure you'll you'll visit there some at some time with one of the assignments that we have. So. I got this stat, and this is um, obviously this is Las Vegas, so this is down the south where I live. This is Nevada overall, and then that blue is the United States. So if you look at this, any illicit drug use, the marijuana use, and then over here on the right-hand side, the prescription type. This might be opiates, pain removers, and the like. You can see that, well, Las Vegas is pretty high, but Nevada is even higher overall than the national average is. And that's concerning because if we have more drug use and there's more addictions within that population of drug users, now not all drug users are addicted or have a substance use disorder, uh, but there's a higher correlation that they will. Just like all people who, don't, who drink alcohol are, don't, aren't necessarily um, have an alcohol use disorder or people who gamble don't necessarily have a common gambling disorder or pathological gambling. Um, but uh, when we see these numbers, this can give us a roadmap of what the kind of resources we're going to need. And I thought it was important. So you guys are in training programs to prepare you uh, to work in the field and be licensed professionals um, for you to see that. So I took um, some population centers from um, our rural Nevada, Elko, Winnemucca, Ely, Pahrump, and then I um factored in that prevalence rate of 3.8 percent just to give us a rough idea this is not an exact figure i'm using this from that national um uh percentage but statistically it's probably pretty accurate so so that means in elco uh with about 20,000 folks uh, we've got 772 individuals who have both a substance use disorder and a mental health disorder that co-occurring condition in Winnemucca, 295, in Ely, 153, in Pahrump, um, 1,400. And then on average, um, time in treatment for, for treating people with SUDs is three months. That's, that's an average. Um, and think about how many folks we need. Just, we're just talking about these uh, rural um, towns and, and cities. We're not talking about the you know, the whole of Nevada, which is about 3 million. Now, how many folks we just need, if you've got this many people, let's say, let's just take Elk for an example, uh, and you need, uh, how many clinicians would you need to, to serve this amount of people? Um, and the fact of the matter is they don't exist. And I'm sure you guys know that, right? Um, uh, th there aren't enough uh, providers in your areas. Um, so one of the, one of the, um, my goals is to try to get that number up by providing, you know, good training, um, good education, and then um, folks who are interested to pursue licensure and, and uh, clinical service, because it's just something that's so necessary. And I'll get a little bit deeper into that. Let's see. There's 46 folks on there right now. Okay. okay. And this is a little older uh, information, but I was actually at this um, when this researcher presented this information. And if you look at the provider supply, this is from 2015, um, it's probably hasn't changed much. The numbers might've changed, but the ranking is probably very similar. Um, psychiatrists, psychologists, MFTs, mental health counselors like myself, sub substance abuse counselors like myself, uh, mental health, substance abuse social workers, psychiatric aides and psychiatric technicians. If you look here at the ranking, this is where we stand in those provider types. And feel free to um, chime in if you have any questions or comments in, in the chat box, and I'll try to 
keep an eye on it. So um, we have more of a discussion. You don't feel like you're just listening to me. I don't feel like I'm just talking on my screen. Um, so we can see 50th, 48th, eighth. We have a lot, for some reason we have a a lot of MFTs. Um, probably because the training programs we've had in UNR, you know, we for that are, have been around for a while. Um, mental health counselors, 40th, substance abuse, uh, 47. You know, this is this is the number I'm concerned with here. And so that's our ranking, and that, that's not a good number. That's that's we're like almost last in every category. Um, and then I had I got another um, a statistic from the National Health Center. Uh, excuse me, the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis. Um, they call we call HRSA in the, in the field, um, and they provide a lot of funding too to try to get folks trained up. So this is the projected supply minus the demand in 2025. So for substance abuse and behavioral uh, disorder counselors, we're going to be at a deficit of 16,000. 540 nationwide. Mental health and substance abuse uh, social workers, 48,540. At a deficit, that, that minus signs in front there. And then mental health counselors, a negative 26,930. So if we, uh, and one of the things, I cleaned up um, some of the information because it was uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of data in one slide. Uh, one of the things that they factor in is attrition. That's folks who die or retire. Um, and you start to think about that, like that's really important to that we replace those ranks. And if people aren't coming into the field and there's more leaving, then we're having even greater crisis. This was a conservative estimate. They had a couple different scenarios depending on what changed, population growth, things like that. Um, but this gives us, like I said, some, some information um, uh, to help plan. Um, and I, I plan on using this information at, at our next um, department meeting when I meet with um, my boss and the administrators so they start to see the, the urgency for supporting these kinds of programs. Any questions, comments as I'm going along here? Um, I'll give you guys a second to collect your thoughts. I do kind of want to see who's on here. Why is there Aaron? Hi, Aaron. Um, Bianca, we have a lot of folks on tonight. Cool. I really appreciate that. It makes my job more fun. Here's Paula. Um, I know all you guys. I'm seeing just looking at it. I'm giving you a little shout out, so so it's a little more fun. Okay, so moving on. Um, do, okay, so there's a question from Terry Ann. Do I have good connections for graduates? Um, in Southern Nevada, I do. In Northern Nevada, I not so much. But um, I'm willing to write letters of recommendation. Uh, we can research uh, areas together. And of course, you'll be doing your practicum. So you're, that's the whole point of the practicum, that you're developing your network, your professional network before you graduate. So when you go out to work in the field, you'll have an opportunity. Um, I'm in the social work program, so that's okay. I don't, oh, Danielle. Okay. Uh, Danielle, 3.4, it was 3.8 actually. Um, yeah, of course, if, 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 yes. So I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. Is it okay that you're here tonight? Yes, so, so we, um, or I uh, marketed this meeting to, to the college at large. So whoever's here who's interested, I'm, I'm grateful to have you. For those folks that are in my programs and um, are required to be here, uh, that's great too. So what, what, I'm, what I'm really trying to do is just get more information out to, to our, our you know, college community and folks who are interested in our programs um, to get a little bit more information about it. So. Yeah, um, the, the 3.8, that is, um, no, it's not any, any yeah, so is that's the prevalence rate. Prevalence rates mean that's what's where they're at. So yeah, some people get better and some people, you know, um, different things happen, they, they're, they're not represented in that group anymore. Um, and so that's a standard, like we use prevalence rates to understand lots of different uh, illnesses, uh, diseases, and so we'll say at any given time, this many people have that, you know. Um, and that's very high for mental disorders because most mental disorders are around 1%, 1.5%, 1, 1 like let's say at any given time, um, the major disorders, depression and anxiety are higher, but and I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Um, so yes, welcome, Danielle. We're happy to have you. Um, Aaron's got a question. I noticed MFTs are prevalent in the West Coast area. You know. 
how much beneficial, uh, how beneficial much they can be with SUDs from what I've seen to work with the state. It's, yeah, so part of the problem is in the graduate training programs, um, and I'll speak to the major disciplines that provide mental health services, social work, uh, clinical mental health, and marriage and family therapy. Then there's also psychology, psychology and psychiatry. They don't get a lot of training um, in, in substance abuse counseling or substance abuse interventions or substance use in general. They do get some, and the idea is they're able to treat based on that. But what I found is a lot of providers feel don't feel fully prepared, so they tend to work with different populations. That will you said it a, 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 a very uh, a bigger deficit, and so you know that's my goal is to try to build up this workforce so people are more comfortable, they're more educated, they're more prepared to work with the, that population. So um, we have those folks in the ranks to provide those clinical services. Uh, hopefully, that answered your question. So, yeah, like I, I literally, I was putting this slide together and like. I got like a sinking feeling in my stomach and I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? You know, this is 2025, um, a projection. It's like, we're 2022 coming up. So this is serious. And, and I think, you know, there's so many issues going on and we, if we don't have enough providers, how can we help people through these, these struggles? Um, and I don't want to be ominous or anything, but you know, definitely. Um, okay. So, I think this is the same slide. I don't know why I left it in here. I meant to delete it. Like I was saying, it was kind of, yeah, I pulled out this number here. 16, Oh, I think I just I did transpose that. Okay. Uh, so, oh, okay. So this was the, this was the estimates from 20, 2013 then 20 production to 2025. So you could see um, the supply versus the demand um, that, you know, they were in alignment. So except for psychiatrists, there was a big problem there. And now this is where we're looking at where there's going to be some deficits. Um, substance and behavioral disorder counselors, looks like there's a, a net gain here. Also behavioral health phys physician assistants, 450. So not every area is like doom and gloom, but... Um, so, okay, so Mark asked a question, uh, why is the mental health, substance abuse, social workers deficit so high? Um, these folks can be, it can be really challenging to work with them. There's often not enough funding to provide uh, adequate services. So the clinician's working um, with more on his, on his or her caseload um, than they might, you know, which, which is ideal. And then, you know, there's a lot of professional burnout. People get tired of, um, not being, feeling supported or not having um, enough uh, folks in the field. So they're, they're kind of carrying the burden. So that's why we have to, you know, support, um, support each other. So we don't have that. And, you know, there's ways around clinical burnout, you know, controlling how much you work and um, advocating for yourself and, you know, taking time off when it's necessary. Um, yeah. Janine says she's been there. Done that. Okay, Bianca, um, that was more like whatever thought that. Yeah. So before we get started in, so I just wanted to um, kind of paint a picture of the clinical scene and where we're headed, and then maybe that information will help us, you know, fill that need or, or you know, maybe inspire folks to think, well, maybe this is something I, I might want to do and I have the, the, the ability, you know, the, the talent for it. Because some folks, you know, have a natural talent for this kind of work and that's um, really hopeful. So um, before we get into um, some of the issues surrounding trauma and addictions, um, and I, I have way more, like I said, way more slides than we have time for. And I, could, I just couldn't help myself. I was getting really overzealous. But I thought it would be helpful. I think we've talked till seven, so I should be okay. So I'm coming up on six, I get an hour. Um, that we define substance abuse uh, disorders for those folks who are in my classes that know that or you know, are just getting introduced to information or to those folks who this is very new to them and they're, they're not familiar with it. So looking at this from a clinical perspective and what it means to have a substance use disorder. First of all, that's the term that we use in clinical, a clinical setting. Um, we don't say alcoholic, drug addict, uh, any of those things that are 
kind of, uh, they, they paint kind of a negative picture of the individual. And they also identify the person as the disorder, which is not something anybody would want having done to them. You wouldn't want to say, I'm, a, I'm diabetes, or I'm a diabetic, or I'm a schizophrenic. We don't use those terms anymore. That we've recognized that um, they don't really honor the individual's experience and separate the disorder from the individual. So we will say somebody from uh, suffering from substance use disorder or uh, an individual diagnosed with SUD and, and the like. So let's just go over the criteria, what it means, and then uh, talk about some of the ways that presents itself and some of the challenges when trying to um, to get folks to you know modify those behaviors, change them, and then recover. So okay, um, the SUDs are classified as mild, moderate, or severe. Um, depending upon how many of the diagnostic criteria a person meets. So out of this list, depending upon how many of you, you check off and you know, count your, um, then that, that, that will classify you with, or the, the individual being diagnosed with the mild, moderate, or severe um, diagnosis. Okay, so the first one is hazardous use. So have you used, and you can, you know, whatever substance, this can be alcohol, uh, any number of illicit drugs, things like that. Have you used a substance in this way that are dangerous to yourself or others, overdose, driven while under the influence or blacked out? Um, and sometimes when you ask these questions when you're doing an assessment, they'll say, no, no, I've never driven, you know, and it's like they've done other things like, I don't know, been on a four wheel or, or pilot a boat or things like that. And so sometimes you want to, you know, as you're doing it, you want to make sure you vet out the question because it, it can be intimidating and, and, and embarrassing for the person. So you want to try to ask the question as a matter of fact, but also try to get accurate information so you provide a good diagnosis. Okay, number two, social or interpersonal problems related to substance use. Um, substance use can cause relationship problems or conflicts with others. So this is fighting with your spouse, fighting with uh, uh, friends, family, could be work associates, um, your neighbor, things like that. And like, oh, I was, yeah, I was under the influence at the time this happened. So um, number three, neglected major roles to use, failed to meet responsibilities, work, school, home, um, because of substance use. Withdraw, uh, when you stop using, you, you experience withdrawal symptoms. You feel sick, you feel like a, a strong craving to use again. Um, this happens specifically, well, with a lot of different drugs so that alcohol can be very dangerous withdrawing if you're, you're, you know, high, heavy, heavy use. Um, and this is why we have detox to help folks uh, get over those um, withdrawal periods. It can last from, you know, three to five days to up to a week or 10 days. Uh, tolerance, having built up tolerance um, to the substance so that you have to use more to get the same effect. So that's it. Like if you, you know, have one beer, one night, then two beers the next night, and then three just to get the same effect. So your body, um, your hepatic functions, liver, um, digestion, um, you know, uh, kidneys will will compensate to try to detox your system. That's what they're trying to clean that those substances out of your blood so you're not affected and you're fighting it the other way by by dosing. So um, using larger amounts longer uh, than you had planned to. So you started to use larger amounts or use substances for longer amounts of time. Repeated attempts to control or quit. You try to come back or quit entirely, but haven't been successful. Uh, much time spent using, spending a lot of your time using the substance. Um, physical or psychological problems related to use. Substance use has led to physical health problems such as liver damage, lung cancer, psychological issues, such as depression, anxiety. Activities given up to use, uh, skipped activities, stop doing activities you once enjoyed. And then uh, the last one is craving, experience of cravings for the substance. And as I had mentioned, in order to be diagnosed with the substance use disorder, you must meet two or more of these criteria. If you meet two or three of the criteria, you have a mild substance use disorder. Four to five, considered moderate. Six or more, you have a severe substance use disorder. Anybody have any questions about that? Um, now, this diagnostic criteria doesn't really paint the picture of what it looks like for somebody who um, has a substance disorder. What are some things that you guys have experienced? I'm sure, uh, unfortunately, we, we have had those experiences in our lives with friends, families, loved ones, ourselves, what comes as a substance. Uh, 
well, we're talking about mind altering substance like illicit drugs, marijuana, cocaine, uh, methamphetamines, um, any kind of psychopharmaceuticals that people abuse to get high. Um, but there are different types of um, addictions and, and use disorders that don't meet that criteria. Uh, people gambling has its own uh, shopping, um, sex, you know, and those those types of things. So th th those are they can become addictive in, the, in their in their own right. And the hallmark of substance use disorder is escaping your emotions, escaping your mind. Um, So what happens next when you evaluate the client and they check off on a lot of these criteria? Well, the, it's your assessment is to determine where they're at, uh, how, how pronounced the, um, the disorder is, and then that will give an idea of what kind of treatment they need. And in this country, we have different levels of treatment and we might have recommend inpatient care, partial um, hospitalization, uh, intensive outpatient or or outpatient. So outpatient is like coming to your your meeting once a week or going to group once a week. Um, IOP would be going to groups three or four times a week and also doing individual counseling and maybe doing some support peer counseling like AA or NA, things like that. So you have a lot of support to help change the behavior, to help you cope, to help you learn new skills, to help you um, change just, just about everything in your life. Um, and what if they refuse, but the situation is dire? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's not illegal to have to be addicted to drugs and alcohol. And just like medical treatment, people can refuse the treatment. And unfortunately, a lot of times people don't seek treatment when they have this disorder. And a lot of times the family, friends are really concerned and want them to get into treatment, but they they don't. So when I when I work with folks like this and I tell the family, you've got to stop enabling them. You have to find, you know, create some healthy boundaries. Um, so you don't become part of the problem and you don't uh, continue enabling that behavior. Thanks, Felicia. Um, so hopefully that, um, so this is, so we're getting what it looks like, what, what the symptomology looks like, but in your experiences, what is something, some behaviors that you notice with folks who are, and you guys can just chime in as you want, um, with folks who, who are, who, do have a substance disorder or you suspect that they do? What kind of, what kind of behaviors do, 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 are associated with addictions? Maybe you don't, you don't, <laughs> I was thinking, well, maybe you guys don't want to talk. Um, so just think about it for a second. Anybody? Okay, so this is kind of just to give you a basis of, you know, how you might um, determine uh, the, diagno the diagnostic criteria, excuse me, the diagnosis, and then what we call um, the, the severity. So mild, moderate, or severe. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over this stuff, even though it's really interesting because I don't know how we're out of time. Um, but let's get into um, when we say trauma. Oftentimes, we're referring to folks who meet criteria for um, post-traumatic stress disorder, right? And then I'm gonna go through the diagnostic criteria for that and and talk a little bit about that. And then you can kind of you'll you'll start to be able to see how why trauma and addictions, um, you find them together. Remember I said the hallmark of addictions is escape, numbing, you know, um, escaping your emotions, your mind. Um, and you'll see that here after I go through um, this diagnostic criteria. Now, a lot of times people use a lot of these words um, very, you know, kind of in the common vernacular, like, oh, I'm addicted or I got PTSD. You might have, and it, it, honestly, it's not, it's kind of a glib attitude to take for folks because once you see how, how um, debilitating PTSD can be, it's not cute, you know, uh, to say things like that. I hear it all the time and it, it irks me because I work with people who really struggle for years um, trying to overcome uh, some of this trauma. 
And um, we're talking about psychological trauma, but okay, of course, physical trauma can cause psychological trauma, right? You could, you could be injured, you could lose a limb, you could be um, severely uh, disabled for, from different kinds of accidents and that has its own physical as well as psychological effects. So uh, let's go through the criteria here and then we'll have a little discussion about that. Um, so this is, um, these are in, in groupings. Uh, this is the, the A grouping or cluster of, of symptoms. And um, there, I think there's, it goes all the way through F. So we'll try to get through that quickly and then we can have a little bit of discussion on how to, how to work with folks and treat them. Um, exposure to actual threat, excuse me, expose, exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violence in one or more of the following ways. So within this cluster A, it has to be one or more. So directly experiencing the traumatic event, witnessing in person the event, um, learning that the traumatic event has occurred uh, to a close family member or close friend. In case of actual threatened death of a family member or friend, the events must have been violent or accidental. Experience repeated or extreme exposure to adverse details of traumatic events. So we see this in first responders, you know, ambulance and fire and police. Collecting human remains. Um, police officers repeatedly exposed to details of child abuse. Um, and then uh, criterion A4 does not apply to exposure through electronic media, television, movies, or pictures unless exposure is work related. So <laughs> what they're trying to say without saying is if, if this is your thing and you like looking at this stuff, then it can't be considered uh, tra traumatizing because if it's if it's disturbing to you, you're not going to do it for kind of pleasure, so to say. I know it sounds a little weird to talk about, but this is something they had to account for. So one or one or the uh, one through four of the following in cluster A. So cluster B, presence of one or more of the following intrusive symptoms associated with traumatic events beginning after the traumatic event has uh, beginning after the traumatic event or events occurred. Recurrent, involuntary, and intrusive distressing memories of the traumatic event. So you might call those flashbacks. Um, note in children uh, older than six years old, repetitive play may occur in which themes or aspects of the traumatic event are expressed. So we'll see, we'll see the children acting out the traumatic uh, events through play and, and reenacting it sometimes. And of course, adults do that in their own way. Recurring distressing dreams in which the content or affect of the dream are related to the traumatic event. Uh, no children that may be frightened by dreams without recognizable content. So they might not be able to articulate it. They'll just be feelings or images that are kind of um, unrecognizable, uh, obtuse, you know, blobs attacking them, shadows coming after them, nothing specific. Dissociative reactions um, in which the individual feels or acts as if the traumatic events were occurring. Such reactions may occur in a continuum with most extreme expressions being complete loss of awareness of present surroundings. Uh, and this is this goes on a continuum, so that can be from complete loss. You're just back in that place. You know, we've seen those with folks who've suffered trauma in in war and, and with veterans and things like that. And they will they will like they're back on the battlefield, and the noises, the smells, everything is 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 present. And that's another hallmark of trauma is. Um, or PTSD is that the past is present. The mind is almost has trouble differentiating from that past experience to now. And that's why we have to consolidate some of those memories and then um, to help uh, reprocess that information so it no longer it, it is acting out in the current time uh, in the present. Um, the next uh, symptom is intense or prolonged psychological distress at exposure to internal external cues that symbolize or resemble the aspects of the traumatic event. So loud bangs, um, uh, anything that kind of reminds them of, of that ex aspect, or excuse me, of the, the experience. Um, mark psychological reactions to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. So, you know, we might call this triggering um, to, to use a more common term, okay. In cluster C, persistent avoidance of stimuli associating with the traumatic event beginning after the traumatic event occurs as evidenced by one or both of the following. So you have to meet one of these two criteria for cluster C. Avoidance of or efforts to avoid distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about closely associated with traumatic events. Avoidance of 
or efforts to avoid external reminders of people, places, conversations, activities, objects, situations that arouse distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about closely associated with a traumatic event. So this can be um, like, let's say um, you were attacked um, and, and, and um, injured um, and it, this was a very stressful experience for you and it happened at night in a park. So you avoid parks, things like that. Um, or anything has to do with a park or, you know, and there's all, I mean, you got to think about all of our senses and all the things that, that can, that can trigger those things, sight, sound, smells, um, tastes, uh, uh, textures, you know, tactile experiences. Okay. And then um, cluster D, negative alterations in cognition and mood associated with the traumatic event beginning or worsening after the traumatic event. Um, by uh, as evidenced by two or more of the following, so you have to have two or more of these uh, within it to meet the criteria for PTSD. Now, you might have these things and they're causing distress, but you don't meet the threshold for PTSD. That doesn't mean that you don't qualify for treatment, it just means that we have a certain threshold for this. And we usually, when folks meet all these criteria, they, they have a very pronounced. Um, uh, uh, a disturbing experience from, from these traumatic experiences. So um, inability to remember an important aspect of traumatic events uh, due to dissociative or amnesia and not other factors such as head injury, alcohol, or drugs. So they don't remember, there's gaps in their memory of the event, um, which is common. And if you've ever been in any kind of an accident, things like a lot of times the, the, the memory's not all there. Persistent and exaggerating negative beliefs or ex expectations about oneself or others or the world. I'm bad. No one can be trusted. The world is completely dangerous. My whole nervous system is permanently ruined. So they have this exaggerated uh, belief about others or themselves. And this could be very damaging because it, it doesn't allow for people to have um, healthy interpersonal relationships, which are really important to, um, you know, to a, a healthy um, life. You can't just be alone all the time, which is a lot of times people will do because they, they've lost trust in others and, them, and, and themselves in some ways. Persistent disordered cognitions about the cause or consequence of the traumatic event. So let's say, for example, you, um, a mother was driving her kids to school and there was a, 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 a let's say, a tractor trailer smashed into them and killed the children. They, they might believe that it was their fault, that they will maintain that it was their fault that this happened and no other reason. So we have to, we have to work that out. Persistent negative emotional states, um, fear, horror, anger, guilt, or shame. Um, I've seen, when I've worked with a lot of veterans, I've seen them, they're very angry all the time, they're very tense. Um, and of course, you know, this hurts their interpersonal relationships, their marriage, their family, um, their relationship with their children, their workmates, things like that. Markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities. So they check out of life. They don't work anymore. Hobbies, just things that we do as human beings to, um, to enjoy life, you know, going to concerts, um, taking a walk, going on a hike, you know, any kind of sports, things like that. Feeling of detachment or estrangement from others. Like I'm not like you anymore. You, I, what I've seen and what I've done has made me different somehow. And I cannot, I cannot relate to being human anymore. This is a common experience. Persistent uh, inability to experience positive emotions um, and just happiness, satisfaction, loving feelings. Um, and so they're kind of, they're closed off, they're, they're numb. Okay, we're almost done here. I know there's a lot, but it, I think it's important that we, we all have a shared understanding of what we're talking about before we get into it. Uh, cluster E, marked alterations in arousal and reactivity associated with the traumatic event. Um, so two or more of the following, irritable uh, behavior and angry outbursts with little or no provocation expressed as physical or verbal aggression towards people or objects, reckless or self-destructive behavior, hypervigilance, you know, being on the ready all the time, thinking something bad is going to happen, exaggerated startle response. So like, let's say um, the air conditioning kicks on and, you know, you jump, you spring out of bed thinking someone's going to kill you. Um, so rather than just kind of having a little mild um, irritation from the noise, you, it's, 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 it's more pronounced. Problems concentrating and then sleep disturbances, difficulty falling, staying asleep or worse asleep. And so when I work with folks who have um, severe trauma and PTSD, 
you know, the number one um, symptom of a mental disorder is always sleep disorders. Not sleeping well causes all kinds of havoc on the mind and the body. Um, and so because folks can't sleep who've had these, you know, terrific experiences, um, they, they will drink or, or drug till they black out. They're not even doing it to, to enjoy themselves. They're doing it just to get some sleep because it, it, it's, it, it drives people insane not to get enough sleep. Um, And then the last set of clusters of duration of the disturbance is more than a month. If it's less than a month, it's what we usually call, um, what do we call that? Acute stress disorder. Um, and uh, something like that, is that right? Um, I think that's it. <clears throat> and then they, that will usually uh, resolve itself. So you, as I'm going through these symptoms, you want to think, oh my gosh, I had that, I had that. It doesn't mean you have PTSD because um, it's, it's time and intensity. So if it's less than a month, it might have resolved itself. Um, the disturbance has caused significantly, uh, significant distress or impairment in social, occupation, or other important areas of functioning. So they can't work, um, they don't socialize, uh, things like that. And then the last one, this disturbance is not attributed to psychological effects of substance abuse, medication, alcohol, or other medical conditions. So like, let's say they had a brain tumor that was causing some kind of um, bizarre behavior, things like that. Uh, and then it, it's not caused by, and sometimes it looks like a, a, a person is addicted to drugs. And this is a lot of times first responders, police and fire will think, oh, this person is just on drugs when they haven't used any drugs. So it's often misunderstood that psycho psychotropic drugs will mimic mental illness and mental illness can, can look like substance abuse, if that makes sense. Okay, any questions about that before I'm going on? Um, we have some final specifiers and these are kind of more specific and they might uh, need some, some specific attention. Uh, and these are all, of all the disorders, there's usually a specifier at the end of the, um, the diagnostic criteria. So this is PTSD with disassociative symptoms. The individual symptoms meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition, in response to the stressors, the individual experiences persistent or recurrent symptoms of either of the following. Depersonalization. So they kind of feel uh, detached from the, themselves. Um, they feel like they're watching themselves rather than experiencing through their own body and mind. And then derealization, they don't um, believe what's happening around them or it's um, like a dream. Okay, and then there's specifiers with delayed expression. So the full diagnostic criteria are not meant for at least six months after the event, although the onset of expression of some symptoms may be immediate. So they can this this can present itself over time. It doesn't always have to happen. And I've seen people that make criteria for post traumatic stress disorder that were in the Vietnam War, and they just living with it, you know. Okay, and then some risk factors for PTSD. Um, <clears throat> experience intense or long lasting trauma. So let's say um, a child who is physically sexually abused in the home and it has happened um, you know, for a long period of time, let's say from their entire childhood. Now, when they grow up and then they're exposed to another traumatic event, they're more likely to develop PTSD because of that, because they already have um, some things working against them. Um, having experienced other trauma early in life, I think I just answered that. Um, yeah, there was time. And having a job that increases your risk of being exposed to traumatic events such as military personnel and first responder. This is something that I've always been um, an advocate of. Folks who are in these first responder positions or in, in military combat roles should be screened for having these risk factors and at least being informed. Say, hey, did you have a really traumatic child childhood? If you're going to be in, you know, in a combat role, this this is a, this is a serious risk factor. And I'm not saying that, they, they, you know, they can make a choice, but a lot of times people come back from war and they think, oh, it's the war. It's like, well, yeah, but how come all their other, um, the other folks in their units didn't, weren't affected the same because they had higher risk factors for developing these disorders. Having other mental health problems such as anxiety or depression, 
having problems with substance abuse, misuse, excessive drinking. And that's the whole, that's a culture in military, right? A lot of times the young, these young men or, or any women are abusing drugs and alcohol, especially alcohol. That's just kind of like part for the course. Lack a good support system for family and friends. Uh, so not having um, people to rely on, people you trust. And then having blood relatives with mental health problems, including anxiety or depression. So these are um, things to consider uh, when you're taking a history and, and uh, building your assessment. Okay, and then complications related to it. Um, you know, this disorder can, can, can really turn your life upside down. And it also uh, has a likelihood of increasing um, uh, other, other mental disorders. So um, some of the complications around with it is you've got PTSD with depression, anxiety, and then PTSD with a substance use disorder or eating disorder or suicidal thoughts and actions. So and we see that's very common, especially in men um, who have access to firearms. Okay, so what do we do with all this? Um, any questions or comments before I go on? I know that was a lot to get through. I don't know how much time we've got. Okay, we have about a half hour, so I'll do the best I can in that time and then leave some time for questions. Um, and you can imagine, uh, based on the this, this symptomology of PTSD and the symptomology of the SUD, how those two play into one another. Um, they, they, they echo each other in lots of different ways. Interpersonal concerns, sleep disturbances, um, you know, uh, disassociation, de derealization, depersonalization. Those things happen when you're using drugs, right? Um, and I think a lot of times when we're trained to work on an intervention, we'll say, okay, well, so what's the issue? Well, I had this erratic experience. Okay, so let's just start talking about it. Let's just get in there and figure it out and help you reprocess the trauma, compartmentalize it, and then you know you'll, it'll be done. Well, what happens is as this person's talking about these traumatic experiences, they're re there's a reason they don't talk about it. Their mind is protecting them. Um, the mind and the body have a tremendous capacity to protect itself, to heal itself. When it can't heal itself, what it does is it tends to, we'll, we'll see this in, uh, in, in, in medical illnesses, um, opposed to mental disorders, the body will encapsulate the area in some tissue or some way that it, it shuts it off so it can't do more harm to the system. Um, the one thing that comes to mind is tuberculosis. So um, a lot of folks who before there was, um, they were able to get treatment and back, uh, be va vaccinated for um, tuberculosis, the body would develop these um, calcium capsules around the infection sites within the lungs, and that would that would kind of put this, the virus in stasis, and then th they could go on living a normal life. But as they got older into old age, the body would absorb that cal it would need that calcium uh, in the bones, and it would absorb it. And then a lot of times you'd see um, folks in their older years uh, that virus reactivate, and then you know kind of that's what kind of takes them out. Um, my dad had, um, he, you know, when he, would, he, he grew up in Mexico and he didn't have, had developed tuberculosis and had those, um, they do x-ray scans on his lungs and they would show those calcium deposits and that's what they were doing. They're, they're finding a way to, to, um, to allow the person to live, but it necessarily, it was able to get rid of the virus and PTSD can be the same way. It's like, it's a way of the mind's find, trying to find a way to protect itself from decompensating. So just, they don't just fall apart or they're not in, you know, in crisis 24 um, seven. So then you're asking this client to come in, talk about these issues, and then they start to tense up. They start to have flashbacks. They're having um, nightmares, night terrors, uh, they disassociate right in the chair in, in your therapy session, right? So you can't attack trauma directly. Um, and I have a little story I'd like to share about that and how, what trauma from a kind of a, a psychologically symbolic um, explanation of it and its outcomes that are, aren't always necessarily bad. Um, and then how as clinicians, we have to um, approach this, this area of um, um, 
you know, the serious disorder and, and how we can we can help our best our work with our clients through it. Um, somebody's calling me. It's probably some of the students. Okay. Before I get into that, any any questions, comments? Okay. So who remembers this figure here? This is uh, old ancient Greece mythology. Anyway. No. So this is Medusa. I think we all remember her from Clash of the Titans. Um, she's got serpents for hair and her gaze would turn anybody into stone. Um, so she's this monster that um, Perseus vanquishes to in order to to fight this bigger monster. It's like you know, kind of fighting fire with fire. And she 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 uh, epitomizes the traumatic the the victim of trauma. She becomes this ugly. Uh, hold on. So I think this is. I'm not answering. I think it's one of the students, but I can't answer. So I want to stop right now. Um, she epitomizes um, the victim of trauma. They feel ugly inside. They feel broken. They they are ostracized. So she lives alone in a cave. You know, um, her she has the body of a serpent, um, and then of course these these serpent uh, locks in her hair, his hair. But she wasn't always um, that way. She was a, a priestess um, and this beautiful woman, and she was. Um, pursued by a, a god, and I think it was Poseidon, if I'm not mistaken. And um, she um, was, actually, she was violated by him. She was raped by him. So um, in, in punishment for her tempting this, this god, um, her, the goddess that she served, uh, I think was Athena um, or Aphrodite, turned her into the monster. And that, that seems so unfair, right? So she's not, it's not through her own fault um, that, um, that she's, she's violated. And then on top of that, she's transformed into a monster. So this, we see this often with victim blame, right? Uh, when people are sexually assaulted, they, they, they used to be, and now we're kind of more aware that people would blame the victim or um, people of, of violence will say, well, you know, why were you there? What were you doing there? And so adding insult to injury is this, this individual suffers the, the traumatic experience and then the after effects where they're ostracized and they're ridiculed and blamed for it. <clears throat> so this uh, quote from Harris is that the Gorgon, these are the sisters, Medusa was made out of the terror, not the terror out of the Gorgon. Um, Hold on, somebody's really gonna to talk to me, so I gotta answer this. Who's Oscar? Oscar, we can't see the current slide. Oh. We're all behind. It's still on current criteria for substance use disorder. Oh gosh, thanks for what I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, I don't think you can see our messages. Okay, let me stop sharing and then I'll reshare. the entire thing just locked up. I can't see anybody anymore. Hmm. 
Okay. So can you guys hear me now? Sorry about all that. I, now, so it's funny, I'm sitting here asking, I was like, anybody got any questions? And I don't see anything. Uh, so I'm like, I guess they're, you know, they're not. Okay, now I can see a bunch of stuff. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Tell him one of those chats will intrigue that. Yeah, I wasn't getting any chats or any questions. And uh, now I feel bad because I can see there's a lot of questions. Let me pull up the slide again. And hopefully I'll pay attention. Well, we'll have Aaron send me a text. He's my little tech helper right now. Thanks, Aaron, for that. I'm like, what is going on? This is an emergency. Okay, share screen. There we go. So where we go, we'll pull back to the chat, copy and paste my question from earlier. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm, if you asked a question and I was not in there, please know I was not ignoring you. I didn't see anything. I would just look over there and it'd be blank. I was like, okay, guess they're good. Um, could PTS flagshots be viewed for, as a form of psychosis, Felicia? Um, psychosis, so a mental disorder, yeah but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, we have flashbacks all the time, positive things, right? It can just be a way of information processing. And that's what I, that's one way that I frame the information. Like it's bothering you and you need to do something about it. Like if you have like a, a wound, you have to care for it. The body tries to help communicate with us to let us know. Um, so we have to kind of work with it. Okay. so. We have you back. Thank you, Terry Ann. Okay, Savannah, would you say that the kind of trauma someone goes through can affect uh, what kind of substances they seek out? Yeah, so a lot of times it has to do with their personality, though, in my experience. Um, but let's say you, you do suffer from PTSD and you want to forget. You don't want to be aware. So you might go after heavy substances that allow you that, if that makes sense. Um, God, I'm so sorry this happened. It's okay, we'll get through it here. Come on, let's do it again. Let's solve this problem. There we go. Yeah, I mean, it can, like it can be. Felicia, I'm answering you. It can be, but it isn't necessarily. Um, so it, it depends how it's presented. Um, and it can be kind of difficult to vet out. But let me finish with this uh, this mythology that um, speaks to uh, a deeper psychological truth that helps us understand uh, PTSD. Um, so as we're getting to, can you guys see the picture of, of Medusa and the priestess before, as she was transformed from this beautiful woman into this, um, this terrible monster? Um, oops, so, so this is Aphrodite. Is that Aphrodite? Yeah. Um, and um, hold on. sorry, I, 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 Athena, excuse me. Um, and she's the goddess of war and strategy and intelligence and things like that. So Perseus goes to her and says, How can I how can I vanquish uh, this titan that he has to fight? And he she tells her, tells him. Um, take take my shield, take the shield, and use it to um, to destroy her. Um, and you can use the head, um, you know, behead her, and then use that head to um, turn the kraken or the the titan into stone. And then, um, but as my reward for helping you, I want that head. And she, this is affixed in, on her on her shield, and you'll see it in later iterations on there. So Perseus. Uh, the good warrior vanquishes Medusa, but he doesn't do it directly. Um, he takes the inside of the shield, which is like has like a mirrored surface, because if he looks directly at her, uh, it'll kill him or he'll turn to stone. And so he uses that reflection to attack her, um, so he's not affected by her gaze. 
And this is a sign of how you approach trauma. So remember I said earlier, Medusa, this monster is the personification of the trauma in, in the psychological um, symbol, right? And, the, and so they're telling us in this myth, don't attack it directly. You have to come at it from you know, a different vantage point. As I mentioned earlier, when you ask somebody to go into these deep psychological wounds, they, they, they get perturbed by them. They, they, they want to run away from therapy and they drop out often because they're like, every time I go there, this guy just talk, asked me to talk about all these terrible experiences that happened to me. And that doesn't seem to be helping. Um, so, and you can see uh, Athena with, with, the, with the, uh, the head of Medusa on her shield. And like I said, in later iterations. So after Perseus vanquishes her, remember she has been, she was uh, sexually violated by Poseidon, the goddess of the sea. When he cuts her head off, two, um, two beings emerge from her. She was apparently impregnated with twins. And one of those was Pegasus. So this, this mythical beast springs forth from her, um, from her body. And then there's a second, her brother, uh, Creosaur. He's this golden warrior. And these, these two symbols personify two very important um, attributes of the human mind and the human experience. Pegasus, can anybody guess what Pegasus represents? Freedom, yes, good one, that's great. Yeah, good to know. And then Creosaur, the golden warrior. Anybody, can you, just what comes, first thing comes to your mind, resilience, close. Think about gold as the purest substance, right, in, in the old world. And what's more pure than purity, yeah? Yep, that's it. So truth is the way, um, when there's no distractions, there's no misconceptions, gold uh, can be um, used to symbolize the truth, right? Um, and so freedom and the truth are the two um, benefits or uh, that, that come from vanquishing the trauma. And they're also key to working with people because as I said in the, the diagnostic criteria, one of the things is they, they have gaps in their memory, they blame themselves. Those are not truths. Those are um, cognitive distortions. And then they're trapped also by their trauma. They, they still live it every day, even though it happened already. And this is like, this is why these people feel alone, afraid. And when I heard um, Peter Levine describe this um, in one of his books, this really made a lot of sense to me. And I, and I went into it. I use it as a as a, a learning tool with all of the clinicians that I train. Um, and he also, um, Perseus also uh, extracts two vials of blood from Medusa's body, one from the left side of her body and one from the right side. And the one from the left side um, has the power to kill. And the one from the, I'm sorry, the other way around, the one from the right side has the power to kill. Um, it's poison. It's a deadly poison. And the other vial of blood, same body, has the power to heal and bring back to life. And when people have suffered tremendous trauma, they feel dead inside. And, and if they overcome the trauma, so this is the idea that the blood coursing through this monster's vein is going to kill you, or it has the power to heal and even resurrect you. And sometimes when people they're able to let, let down their, these memories, when they're able to process it and grow from it, they tell me, I'm reborn. I feel like a new person. And this is the other uh, aspect to, to, to one, I help to, I use these um, symbols to help motivate people to go into trauma treatment because a lot of times it's such a scary prospect that they avoid it. Um, okay. So that's kind of the end of, you know, my little, uh, Myth, myth motif that, that is giving us some deeper insight, as I mentioned, a psychological truth to working with this disorder. And think about that the Greeks had these ideas already. They knew them. And when I was trained, we didn't, they didn't tell us these kinds of things. And, and it helped me so much to, help, to be sensitive and compassionate and to understand what people are going, are going through. Um, 
Uh, thanks, Aaron, again for blowing up my phone to like, we weren't sleeping on you. People are asking questions in chat. Okay, thanks. Um, and so before I go on um, to get into, um, I've got just a, about 20 minutes, but I think I can get there, and how we will approach this. Um, and it's, it's, it's not too difficult to, to explain, it, but hopefully it will give you some trauma-informed uh, information. So if you, or when you're working with people in trauma, you can take that into consideration. But I just wanna open it up any questions or comments people might have. Okay, just moving them along then. Um, so one of the things that you want to remember is the body and the mind have their own healing faculties. They have the, the power to heal themselves. When they can't is when they need intervention, they need help from us from the outside. But what we're going to do, what all medical professionals do and mental health professionals, we assist the system in it helping itself. So we create an environment where they, the body can heal or the mind can heal. And we want to trust the wisdom of the body and the mind and not derail it with, and, and, and not in all cases, but sometimes drugs, even psychotropic drugs that are prescribed to help with symptomology can interfere with that. So they, they, they should be responsibly used um, uh, and, and prescribed in a way that's medically necessary. And then of course, in, in time, they should back off because what drugs don't do is they don't help you learn. They don't help you reflect. They don't help you grow. What they can do is calm down the nervous system, um, upregulate, downregulate, reduce symptoms of anxiety, depression, things like that. But it's more of a numbing effect and it, and it has other disadvantages to learning and growth and healing. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying don't take it. Don't don't misunderstand me here. I'm saying that it should be used responsibly, um, and that means your medical provider and it's prescribing it should be talking with you about it and working with a therapist um, is always a, the best um, type of treatment. Okay. Um, why do I hear about complex PTSD? Um, it's just basically the same. I think complex PTSD was in the DSM-4. In the DSM-5, they changed the, the diagnostic criteria. And so it doesn't, uh, they probably don't use that anymore. But it, 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 it was a very common uh, diagnosis that was used. Um, and you, you could still use it. But I, I think if that, my memory is correct, that that's the issue that it changed from the DSM-4. They recategorized a lot of um, disorders and changed the names a little bit here and there. Yeah, that's true too, but you're not going to see PTSD from a single event usually. It's going to be usually compounded. Um, what's important, what's more important, like I think um, when you're learning about this stuff, you get hung up on the diagnosis, but what's really important is how we can help them. Um, do you really care what, what it's called, what you got, or, or do you want some kind of relief from it? Um, and I don't want people to identify too much with their disorders. Um, okay, uh, are there any, so Tiffany asks, is there any questions not to ask the patient? Well, you have to develop rapport and know what they're able to, to handle. So we, we want to, you know, honor their experience, be respectful, and then notice their level of, um, functioning. Are they getting anxious? Are they getting nervous? Are they, are they, you know, clenching their hands? Are they sweating? We don't want to create this uh, overwhelming experience for them because they can't handle just even their own intrusive thoughts and all the other symptoms that are, that are affecting them. So what we want to do is create a place of, of safety and security to help them process through it because they can't process it because just the idea of thinking about it forces them. If anybody's ever had a really bad breakup, uh, let's say, uh, uh, or divorce, I'm sure you think about it a lot, and wish you hadn't, but your mind is working it out. It's processing and processing it over and over and over and over until you come out with a new understanding of it. It's, it's, just, it's There's a reason for that. Is your mind isn't just trying to torture you, um, but there there is utility in that into healing from the experience. Um, don't anybody tell my ex-girlfriend that. 
Uh, just kidding. So um, let's get into uh, the model of treatment. So we, we talked about addictions, the diagnostic criteria. We talked about PTSD, the diagnostic criteria, the symptomology. And then now let's look at a, a model of treatment. Um, for me, I, I use this book, uh, Rebuilding Shattered Lives. It's one that I uh, was required um, reading for my trauma and addictions course. Uh, and it is um, the hallmark of the model I use. Uh, excuse me. It, it, it is the model that I use for um, working with trauma. And this is the one that I train a lot of my clinicians on. So there's four stages, pre-treatment, early stage, middle stage, and late stage. And I'll try to get those through those as quickly as possible so we don't run out of time. Um, okay, so pre-treatment, um, you, you wanna do a comprehensive assessment. Um, you wanna um, vet out any specific um, symptoms that might be problematic to treatment that you might need to, to treat first. Like if they're suicidal, like if you don't stabilize them with that, then what's the point of, you know, doing anything else if they're not alive, you know? Um, so other, other co-occurring conditions that might complicate treatment. Um, and we'll see this, especially with an addiction, you'll see personality disorders present there. Um, narcissism, antisocial, borderline. I would say the two most common you'll see in addictions is narcissism and uh, borderline. And those are, those are, they can be really challenging and complicate treatment. So once you've done a good assessment, you have a good um, looking for co comorbidity, screening for other disorders, substance abuse, medical illness. It's very important that they're getting treatment for that. Eating disorders that they might not talk about and then affective disorders uh, like borderline uh, or excuse me, um, like bipolar. OK, so in the early stages, you want to focus on safety, focus on individual psychological stabilization. So if they're not able to keep calm, education on their source, skill building. Um, development of the treatment alliance, building community through peers. So they need some, they need social support. They need to learn how to regulate their emotions so they're not um, going off the rails. Uh, they're not losing control. So how how do we teach people to help self regulate? One of the things I like to use is deep breathing exercises, any form of yoga, uh, meditation, any kind of we call grounding techniques, things that keep you from um, bringing your heart rate down, your, bl your blood pressure down, um, slowing down your thinking and focusing your mind on the present moment. So you don't, you're, you're, so you're using, you're basically, you're using your prefrontal cortex, you know, to override your midbrain or your uh, reptilian complex that is, that is overactive. It's getting activated too easily from small stressors like a, a car backfiring, you, you die for cover thinking, you know, somebody's trying to shoot at you. And so it's, it's overactive and it's kind of stuck in that state. It's stuck in the hypervigilant state. So we have to retrain the brain and at least in the short term, teach folks how to modulate their, their, their thinking, their thoughts, their feelings, their breathing. Breathing is, is huge. Um, breathing, slowing your breathing, um, holding your breath for a few seconds and letting out very slowly really has a dramatic effect on, on, on turning down those um, autonomic responses you know, bringing their system down into baseline. So any questions about that? Um, there's different ways to do it. Whatever people like to do is what I try to go for. Um, but if it's not working, then, then I'll, I'll start training them on very specific interventions like muscle, uh, progressive muscle relaxation. So tensing their muscles, relaxing them, pairing that with breathing, pairing that with thoughts of the calm scenes, calm words, um, maybe some music to help. So what we're doing is we're doing like a lot of behavioral interventions. And I mean, like behaviorist interventions, like uh, classical conditioning, you know, think Pavlov's dog and all that. And we're, and we actually have a course um, in the bachelor's program that, that, um, that talks about behavioral conditioning and things like that. Um, any questions about that as I'm going along? I think I need more time for this lecture, but we'll do what we can and maybe we'll have more going forward. Okay, and then, um, so the next stage will be we'll trauma, processing the trauma. Um, this, is, this is where you're getting into the, you know, into the muck. Uh, revisiting these traumatic events, um, expressing the pain, the grief surrounding this, 
the, the therapist serves as a witness um, to, to their experience. And for lots of different reasons, people need to have someone witness their pain without judgment, without shaming them, accepting their experience and allowing them the freedom to kind of be, you know, really cry the way that they need to cry, scream if they need to scream. And so the therapist has to be ready for that. And if you, and a lot of times what draws people to be therapists is their own experiences that were very difficult and they were able to work through, but you better make sure that you stay healthy and those old experiences aren't cropping up when you're working with people, because we talk often in the field about um, secondary trauma, like therapists getting traumatized by their patients' experiences. And um, it can happen, especially if you're working with really, acute populations that have had really serious uh, uh, traumatic experiences. Any questions about that? Do you have an approach between DBT and CBT? I don't, I think DBT is CBT. Um, They just call it something else because you know they're always trying to sell something new. So CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, cognitions, behaviors, um, and then you know um, action something like that and dbt is dialectic behavioral therapy um so kind of putting putting some more stringent constraints on how people approach a problem so basically kind of remedial skills we see this very often with people who um have a borderline personality disorder they have attachment issues and things like that so we're kind of retraining them to have more um kind of acceptance, pro-social behavior, compassion training, things like that. It, that's, a whole, that's a whole semester lecture and it's a course in itself. I hope that answered your question, Janine. Um, and then, so uh, techniques for uh, resolving uh, the trauma, prolonged or gradual exposure to an activating event. So maybe a loud noise, things like that. You're gonna do this very slowly. Um, images and scenes. You could do this through gu- guided imagery of the event, like what was it like being there, things like that. Uh, reprocessing the information, thinking about it in a different way. Cognitive restructuring, uh, the way you think about yourself in that way. So may- maybe changing your attitude and belief. Like, let's say you were a father and, and your belief was, I have to protect my children at all costs. And your children, you weren't able to protect them, they died. So you see yourself as a failure. You punish yourself by abusing alcohol, drugs. Um, acting erratically or making impulsive this decision, you have to start to restructure your own cognitive experience of yourself and, and, and to, to, to transition from what you used to believe in some, some new way that you can um, live with yourself. And it isn't a lie, it's just a different perspective. Narrative exposure, so reading about events and things like that. In group counseling, you might be listening to other people's experiences and, and, and sharing and um, helping process that. And then there's uh, a very co- a very popular um, method called eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. And it can be very effective. It's um it's a it's kind of a staple of the veteran affairs. Uh, a lot of those there there are folks that like to use it. There a lot of those folks are trained in it. Um, I was trained in it and it can be helpful. Okay, so the late stages of um, treatment. Uh, So kind of who who are you now that all this stuff happened? Uh, Self-esteem development, strengthening your self-efficacy, your view of yourself and your your relationships in the world, improve relationship skills, you know, working on compassion, self-compassion, learning how to listen, learning how to express your emotions, articulate those things, issues surrounding intimacy and sexuality, um, making different life choices, vocation. This is, you know, things are getting, things are getting better here at this stage. Now that while this is a model, models are not indicative of reality. So people, they, they might go in and out of these models, you know, that these are just ways of conceptualizing. So we use for training. And then some of the late stages of, um, of, treatment would be exploring who you are, you know, what's this all mean? And a lot of times we'll see people making meaning of their experience. You know, I thought that was the worst thing that happened, but really it forced me to grow into who I am today. And I don't know if I'd let 
I'd, I'd want, if I could go back in time and that not happen to me, I, I'd do that because it's made me who I am today. And I like that. And without experience, I wouldn't have that opportunity. So we see this um, when people are, you know, ready to terminate treatment, the treatment's been uh, helpful. But the most important thing you can remember is, is to, to, to take them at the speed they're at and to build them up and not to rush through the, the process. It's gonna take time. Um, sometimes people have been living with this trauma for decades and it's gonna take time. You wanna be sensitive to that and, and compassionate. And there's no rush. Um, some help is enough. It doesn't, they don't have to get there on our timeline. Um, okay, so uh, that that's my brief presentation. Sorry. Uh, um, on, on trauma and addictions. I'm sorry I didn't have time to go into other areas that I'd like to have covered, but that's where we're at right now. So let me spend the last few minutes answer, answer any questions here. Um, okay, what kind of advice do you give? I know somebody had another question that I, are there any questions not to ask the patient? Um, there's things that you shouldn't say, like, I know how you feel. Or when somebody, you know, people always do this. You, you say, what, oh, what's going on? You know, my grandma died. And then the first people, people say, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, when my grandma died and they start telling you about their life, you're not really listening or there. So then people tend to shut down and decide, well, maybe I don't want to share this because it doesn't seem to be really helpful. And then it makes me vulnerable. And then I just kind of felt ignored and empty and worse off. So this happens a lot of time when people are looking for support. And this is why professionals are trained in a way to respond in a way that um, is helpful, that doesn't kind of uh, create those reactions in individuals. So th things like that. I think the worst thing people can say to somebody is, I know how you feel. You don't have any idea how they feel. Ask them, they'll tell you, listen, um, don't shut them down. Um, let's see, okay. What kind of advice do you give to family members of those who suffer from addictions? Um, you know, we're, we're, we care about our family. We want to help them. Uh, we can let them know that, but we all we also need to let them know that we have boundaries and we're not going to help them. And they'll use any kinds of um, methods of, of maybe manipulating or trying to to get you to help them. Or even I've seen people you know go into rehab just just to appease their family so they can keep getting resources from it. It's really complicated. And that's why I was gonna go into some personality disorders because a lot of times people will say, oh, these are people who have addictions or associates disorders. But in reality, they have these underlying personality disorders that are driving those kinds of behaviors in addition to the addictions. That's often very misunderstood, especially in peer groups. They think, oh, it's just the it's just the substance. It's just, you know, when they stop using it, I'm like, no, those personality traits are there and then they, they need to be confronted. Um, and of course, people with personality disorders, that's kind of their personality. So they don't tend to shift too much um, or look for, for change and they're not interested. They might be, but not always. Um, Next question, hopefully I answer that one. Uh, after successful therapy for PTSD, can the individual be re-traumatized somehow? Yeah, absolutely. But keep in mind, they have skills, they have experience and they're stronger than they were. So it doesn't mean you are, you're never gonna be traumatized again, um, but you're more resilient. Um, and I like somebody mentioned that word resiliency when I said, oh, that wasn't the right one. I like that because Overall, when you overcome trauma, you become more resilient. Uh, will I make this PowerPoint available? Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna upload this to YouTube and I'll send you guys the links. Um, okay, and then there's two more messages. I think I think it locked up again. This is, I can see them, but I can't do anything about it. No, that's not what I wanna do. All right, um, let me stop my share, maybe that'll help. Okay. Nope, that didn't work either. Something happened.
let's wait again. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't see anything again. So since we're out of time, we'll go ahead and end the webinar now. Um, hopefully you guys can even hear me. <laughs> uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming and your questions and your, your thoughtful, um, you know, oh, there we go. Hello. Hello. You have two people asking about the password. Oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. That's a good, uh, the password is, what should the password be? Oh, uh, pumpkin spice. It's pumpkin spice. Can you type it in there? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Just one time. What's that? Is it just pumpkin spice once? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. I, I don't know what to do. It's this has never happened to me before. Yeah. Oh. So you're able to see and talk to them, and I and I can. That's weird. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then one person, I don't know if you want to answer this. Someone creates a false narrative while using all this, and they grow out of it over time. So will they need therapy to accept the truth that it's never happened? <laughs> Sounds very specific question. Um. I, there's it's too complicated to answer this okay. no, I, with, I, without being able to talk to them you guys can't hear me we can take and hear you oh okay so if somebody's developed a false narrative like uh, I don't know for example they have um, they believe something that isn't doesn't correspond to reality. If there is success, they're successful in it. Sometimes they need to they they need to build a narrative that they can live with. Sometimes the past is lost, the memories are gone because during the traumatic experience, there sometimes there's brain damage. Take a take a war situation where there's explosions and people have traumatic brain injuries and things like that. There's actual brain swelling and memory loss um, and loss of functioning. So. What, sometimes what I'll do in late stages of treatment is we, we do that meaning making where we create a narrative that we can live with that is helpful to us because sometimes we don't know what happened. Um, you could go talk to people uh, about it and ask them to fill in the gaps and sometimes that's helpful and sometimes it's not helpful at all and it shouldn't be done. So it's that the, the question, the reason I have a hard time answering the question is because that question is laden. it's a loaded question um, and, and it almost sounds like they're trying to answer something for somebody they experience, you know, uh, in their life. And I don't want to give them information that is going to lead them down the wrong path. So it really depends on the individual. Um, you know, if you believe something and somebody says, well, that's not true. Um, and you know, for some reason it's not true. Well, what, who's to say that's not how they decide to live their life you know we have to honor and respect the individual and, and if you have a problem with that then that's something you need to work out um and sometimes you're never going to get the satisfaction from somebody you'd like to um and you know we have to learn how to live with that uh or not and we can suffer the consequences but um it can get complicated so uh Especially if, like, let's say this was a married couple and one person believes one thing, another person believes another thing. How do we get past that? You know, it can, it can, it, it takes some work if people are willing to do it and go there. I, and not always. Um, and we're, treatment doesn't make people perfect. It just kind of helps them through the rough spots and then gets them back to their normal level of functioning. But existential growth and transcendent experiences, that's a spiritual, you know, lifelong struggle. It doesn't just happen because we went to therapy for, you know, two months or something like that. So any other questions before we sign off? I'm, I cannot see anything. All I can see is the closed captioning on a blank white screen. So 
Okay. All right. Well, everyone have a great night. Thanks again, Aaron, for helping me out with this. I'm sorry that it was so disjointed, the, the presentation. Um, and uh, if you guys have any questions about that, uh, please let me know. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll be glad to email it to you. And then, of course, I'm going to try to put the presentation up there, but I don't know if it's going to work because um, I don't know if it was recorded or not. So um, everyone have a great night, and thanks again. Bye, Aaron. Thank you.